This is a Rook Media Series, The Contemporary History of Iran, Part 24. Hi there, and welcome to the Contemporary History of Iran, a series from Rook Media. This is Part 24, Secularization in Post-Revolutionary Iran. I'm Gian Gomeshi. Our aim with this series is to explore the events, personalities, and issues that have shaped modern Iran. We want to do this as much as possible through a non-traditional lens, through snapshots of change, and using alternative voices or angles. This series is mostly in English and will feature a new episode posted every Thursday across our Rook Media platforms. We will post subtitled excerpts with Farsi Zirnavis on our YouTube and Instagram sites. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It is there that you can link to all of our platforms. And we invite you to check out parts 1 through 23 of this series that are already posted. To become a sponsor or patron of Rook Media, please contact us through our website. All right, let's get started. Here now is the Contemporary History of Iran, Part 24. Well, as the world knows, there was a major revolution in Iran in 1979 that ended the Pahlavi dynasty, dethroned the monarchy, and consolidated in a very different looking state and culture. This revolution is often called the Islamic Revolution, as it culminated with the founding of the Islamic Republic of Iran. But was it really a victory for religion? Or has the Islamization project self-destructed? More specifically, did Iran in the years after the revolution become a more religious and spiritual society, or at least after the death of Khomeini in 1989, did Iran continue its journey into secularism, but a different kind of secularism? This is the subject that has been on the mind of my future guest today, who's written a fascinating new book called Secularization of Islam in Post-Revolutionary Iran. Dr. Mahmoud Pargu is an Iranian-Australian social scientist and philosopher. He's an interdisciplinary researcher at the Middle East Studies Forum at the Alfred Deakin Institute, Deakin University, and a former lecturer at the University of Sydney. He obtained his Ph.D. in social and political thought from the Institute for Social Justice at the Australian Catholic University. Dr. Pargu's first book was entitled Presidential Elections in Iran, Islamic Idealism Since the Revolution. He has written numerous articles in distinguished publications such as the Cambridge University Press, Harvard University Press, and The Diplomat. His research has been cited by The Washington Post, and his analysis has been featured on ABC, BBC, The Atlantic Council, and more. And right now, to discuss secularization in post-revolutionary Iran, I'm joined by Dr. Mahmoud Pargu in Australia today. Hello, sir. Hello, hello, John. Thank you so much for your you know, time. Thanks. Thank you so much for your time and for doing th- Are you in Sydney, by the way? I don't know where in Australia you are. It's a big country. Yeah, I'm in Sydney, yes. This oh. is almost you know, near United States in size, but yeah, 25 million <laughs> People only. That's right. All right. Already a staunch defense of Australia. Uh, we, <laughs> uh, Sydney's a beautiful city. It's it's nice to have you on the program. Let me dive into this by um, just talking about the importance of religion as it was seen from the outside, at least in the the revolution of 1979. You note that in the Western imagination. Few events in recent history have underscored the socio-political importance of religion in contemporary society more so than the Islamic Revolution of 1979. How did the revolution, at least at first, 
Dr. Paragu, challenge the so-called dominant secularization paradigm, the idea that we're headed towards modernity that would lead to the death of religion or its retreat from individual souls. How did the revolution of 79 challenge that at first? Uh, you know, the dominant paradigm before the revolution, or and revolution is not just one of those events, was that the more modern society becomes, the more, you know, irreligious it becomes, or the less religious it becomes. And uh, a few, you know, events have completely changed this conception. Uh, one, probably among the most important ones, is Iranian revolution, especially after, you know, with really widespread modernization before the revolution, then you, you, you see suddenly a religious movement, an entirely, you know, grassroots uh, movement that asks for the, re, say, uh, you know, the return of religion to politics. And it's, it's absolutely against what the dominant theories in socially, sociology of religion, uh, which normally called secularization thesis, you know, it was absolutely against it and it's a complete change. It, was, it wasn't a kind of, you know, uh, individual, say, event was uh, dissociated from other events in the world. It was, it was one of them and this kind of return of religion, of course, was, uh, was visible in other parts of the world too. Name a couple of you do in your book. Name a couple of the other events that that you, you know. You can see the same, you know, uh, return to religion in, uh, in many Muslim countries, to to religion. You know, uh, the Islamic fundamentalism has been rising during this era, and uh, right now we know that probably it was driven by anti-communism fears. So many governments have started, you know unleashing say or uh, you're just making you know religious activities more free or sometimes even encouraging them and you cite uh, examples from around the world too like where where christian uh, uh movements were in ascendance or liberation theology different different examples of where people are suddenly seeing this uh, emergence of religion that that challenges the secularization paradigm. How much did observers in the immediate aftermath of 1979 see the revolution as evidence of a reunification of church and state, if you will, that this event demonstrated a desire of the masses to integrate morality into the state apparatus? Uh, actually, yeah, it was really, uh, you know, that Foucault was, uh, you know, traveled to Iran in the aftermath of the revolution, and he was the one who talked about, you know, uh, spiritual politics and how we are uh, getting back or, you know, uh, from the Enlightenment, new politics which is emerged, you know, which is integrated with this spiritualism. And, and this was the main theme. There were lots of, uh, you know, essays, articles in Western, uh, actually, magazines and, you know, media that, okay, we have this kind of, you know, return of religion. It, it went so far that, uh, you know some uh, religious uh, so, some sociologists who who have been actually advocating a secularization thesis who, who talked about the return of religion and changed the whole you know theories so um, I guess it, it it was a kind of you know widespread uh, recognition of return of religion and in all over the world. Since we're talking about, since we're going to talk about secularization, I thought we might early on here do our best to define secularism from the outset. Obviously, I know that it's got a lot of definitions and you spend a chapter on this. I mean, uh, in its most general sense, I, I wrote down, it, 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 I would say it refers to a displacement of religion for the, the regular lives of individuals. But you write that secularism, let me quote you here, does not denote exclusively a decline in belief or practice, but also a change in the meaning of those beliefs or the interpretation of those practices and you cite for example pop singers who thank the lord when they win an award um can you speak to how you most generally define secularism today oh you know we have uh, different uh, meanings or different for different terms of course you know we have secularism secularism when it is ism 
is normally uh, the idea of separation of religion from politics. And then you have secularization, which is the social process of secularization, which, okay, we have to define what is secularization here, uh, which is, uh, again, different from secularism, which is a political ideology. And then you have the whole, you know, entity of abstract idea of secularity. What what I'm trying to, so, uh, to you know, distinguish between these meanings and then, uh, just focus on secularity or secularization in general terms is uh, yeah there is one uh, probably more public uh, say common meaning of secularity or secularization which is distancing from religion in terms of decline in religiosity whether in belief like you say people believe less in god or in uh, rituals or you know uh, religious uh, actions or uh, religious rituals then you have this kind of declining trends of uh, uh, you know people adhering to those rituals uh, attending in mosques or uh, churches or something this is one meaning so declining religiosity the other meaning uh, is uh, as as i said differentiation of, uh, you know, different forms of, you know, life. One is politics from religion, probably other realms, science from religion and, and you know, other kinds of meaning. The third meaning, which, uh, which is more substantial, and this is the one I'm talking about, yes. is, uh, is how the meaning of religion changes. So sometimes you see people, they still believe in God. They say, you ask them, you go with questionnaires, you know, you say, okay, do you believe in God? Yes, they say, I believe in God. Then sometimes their actions, religious, you know, their adherence to religious rituals, it hasn't changed that much as well. You say, people, they go to mosque, yeah, almost the same, you know, practices. Do they fast in Ramadan? Mm. Okay, yes, they do. But on the other hand, you see, there is a huge shift underlying in the meaning why so I, I've, I've tried to conceptualize this as a as a substantial shift from a religion that was focused on the other world to a religion that is worldly so while you can have you know religion in both in both of the say realms you have religion you are religious but the meaning of religion and the way you think of it, it changes. And of course, the location and the weight of religion in your life changes. So sometimes religion becomes a matter of, you know, rituals and beauty instead of being the substance of life. So these are real changes that happen and often they are ignored because what we can measure is, you know, just, uh, just as people, do you believe in God? They say yes. But the kind of belief you had, say, 200 years ago, it's different from what now I believe. I got right you. Now, I got you. I got you. So, yeah. so, so to use that, that pop singer example, the pop singer wins the, the Grammy Award and says, I want to thank Jesus. Um, but if that pop singer is uh, otherwise not really engaging in any substantial exploration of religion in their life, you you think, despite the the shout out to Jesus, this is a this is an example of secularism. This is a substantial secularization. Yes, that that's what I call substantial secularity. The words and expressions haven't changed. You still say, "I believe in Jesus," but. The background meaning, what is going underlying, you know, underlying all those, you know, words and expresses, the metaphysic behind it has changed. Right. So, right, right now, religion doesn't play the same role it played 500 years ago in your life, in your economy. You don't care about religion. When you are going to doctor, you don't care about religion. You don't care what Jesus says. And in most, you know, political actions, your everyday actions, nothing, you know, is kind of relevant to religion or is being involved about religion. I love this distinction you're making that that secularization doesn't necessarily mean a complete divorce with religion or religious rituals, but uh, can be a process um, and and changing the relationship of that with that religion is part of the secularization. You also there's another term that I I thought I'd I'd want to ask you about too because it is related to what you talk about when you talk about contemporary Iran, modern Iran. Iran uh, post-revolution especially, the term is exclusivist humanism. 
Uh, and you talk about the belief in God being challenged more today than it would have been in the past, and God being one option among many options that that people have, even in Iran. Can you speak to that? Yeah, actually, this notion is a central notion. Oh, you know, very famous uh, philosopher Charles Taylor talks about it. You know, he said the new secular society is a society in which religion is only one option among other options. So, but 500 years ago, it wasn't an option. It was everywhere. You you didn't have the choice. You know, you didn't have you know uh, the the other options to choose in between. But right now, religion is only one among many other alternatives you have. So, in Iran, you you're still in official discourse at least. They they try to always talk as if religion is some kind of you know widespread you know belief. But right now, in, in society, it's it's exactly the same. You can just yes, you go to people. You start, you know, talking to somebody for, for the first time, and one of the questions might be, "Okay, are you religious?" It's it's a question, mm. so it means you have some options, right? And, right. And this is widespread. This is, you know, among people. And when you say, "I'm religious," okay, they say, "Which uh, which kind of religious?" They say, "I'm religion, but uh, let's just say I have some, you know, some beliefs that I, I believe God exists, but I don't practice." So it means, you know, it, it isn't this is an option. What, what what I appreciate about what you've written is that you you're giving words you're putting a thesis on something that i think a lot of iranians especially those in the the diaspora often think about or talk about which is that you know there's this the ascendance of this islamic republic but that a lot of iranians don't necessarily identify with um the the, the level of religiosity that was being preached or that uh, the, the the republic represented um on that note, and I don't, uh, I want to get into the, the the revolution and where the place of religion and secularism has been over the last forty three years or so. But, but I, I, I feel I'd be remiss to not mention this from the outset because it was niggling at me, and I don't want to be too philosophical here. But you are a philosopher, so I get to ask you these kind of questions. Is it really even possible to entertain the idea that this revolution of nineteen seventy nine was about? a new ascendancy of morality and religion when so many atrocities have been committed by the state in the name of that said religion? I mean, is it really even a possible to ask the question? Uh, you know, it's it's a matter of uh, basically interpretations. Who is asking the question and how you interpret Islam, how you interpret religion. If you're somebody who believes that religion can't, uh, you know, um, be consistent with uh, atrocities, be consistent with torture, killing people, innocent people, then probably you would have problem with, you know, with the idea that the uh, Islamic revolution was about ascendance of religiosity. But, but again, Many people don't believe that. They, they, they believe, okay, religion has different faces, different, uh, you know, uh, expressions and interpretations. And so uh, it, it can have, you know, it can be that uh, some, some interpretations of religion are very violent. You know, so. uh, but was Iranian revolution a kind of ascendance of religiosity? Oh, I guess it was. And it was a violent, you know, revolution. It was a kind of violent interpretation of religiosity. And, uh, but of course, you have different, you know, interpretations, different, you know, understanding of religion. Uh, in Within those, you know, interpretations, it's not possible to to talk about the ascendance of religion at the same time atrocities, you know, undertaken by its name, under its name. Uh, Dr. Prago, one thing that's interesting to me, again, before we get to 1979, is that when you draw on the antecedents of the secularization movement, um, you say at one point in your book, when it comes to Islamic secularity, which I'll ask you about in a minute, even that term, but there's a great irony that among the main pioneers of secularization in Iran, as well as some other Islamic countries, were the reformist clergy. Uh, can, can you tell us in simple terms how that's the case? Again, it, uh, we need to go back to the meanings I, you know, talked about. So when I say secularity, it's about substantive secularization of our worldviews. It's not just about the world's views. Okay, so so it means we are shifting our attentions uh, to to this world, you know, to build a uh, you know a, a wealthy society. 
to to uh, you know uh, construct a kind of you know perfect ideal living condition but in this world so it's a kind of shift which i call substantial secularity and uh, yes uh, you know the most um, leaders or you know leaders of this kind of you know reconciliation of uh, the other world and this world by religion was actually reformist clergies one was uh Motahari, the other were Sanglegio, I've talked about them. Uh, the whole idea is that against the t- traditional understanding of religion, Islam is not about the other world only. So it's about, you know, making our this world perfect uh. but observing some religious, you know, or moral, you know, principles. So and this is of course you can see the same idea in uh, you know Sunni fundamentalists in right. Ikhwan al-Muslimin, they say, they call it al-Islam huwa al-hal, al-Islam wa al-dunya wa al-akhira. It means this world and the other world. And if you go to traditional sources, it wasn't the case. I mean, in traditional sources, the main, you know, focus or the ultimate goal of the whole universe is the other one. Mm. You have to live your life as if only thing that matters is the other one and that's why you have a lot of uh, say hadith or religious you know texts which admires poverty and one of the headaches these reformers you know clergy they had oh how we have to you know nullify we have to get rid of these kind of you know admiration of poverty right how we have to get rid of you know this kind of uh, scolding of this worldly life you know in in our religious you know text so it was a huge intellectual say project to kind of shift the attention from the other world to in world you know to this world in uh, you know using all religious you know say uh, arguments and uh, sacred text Okay, let me get to um, uh, Iran in the last four decades. And um, uh, if the thesis is that a process of secularization has continued in post-revolutionary Iran, which we'll get to, it wasn't the case, as we've intimated a couple times already in this discussion, in the immediate aftermath of the revolution. The the Islamic revolution, there's a short interval in the early years where there's a fundamental departure from the profoundly secular framework that it, that was already prepared by even the Muslim modernists in the 19th century. In what way was desecularization successful in those first years after the revolution? Can you point to any examples? You know, uh, the idea of desecularization was mostly pioneered by Khomeini, the first leader of you know Iranian revolution himself, and it wasn't that widespread. Yet, but some people, I, I mean, in terms of doctrine and theory, he was the probably only one who would have lived, you know, to to the real full meaning of you know desecularization. And when he died. The whole, you know, project was stalled, and we we have this return to uh, Islamic secularity. But how did we see desecularization in the beginning, uh, uh, in the immediate aftermath of the revolution? You know, if you if you know Khomeini, Khomeini was deeply uh, influenced by Sufi mystical thinking, and he really believed that we have to get back to to this kind of other world oriented you know uh, say doctrine of islam so he always thought uh, talked about how uh, you know some people they they just express islamic you know sentences and words and you know phrases but they don't believe in the in the whole meaning of it and he he knew all of these you know nuances and and that's why uh, during the revolution uh, there were Plenty of times that happened, people talked about economy, you know, and th- these were modernists, uh, say, cleric, that uh, say, okay, if we need to, you know, uh, do some sacrifice here uh, for, the, for the sake of economy, for, the, you know, uh, we need these. And, and Khomeini would say, oh, no, economy is for donkeys. We are humans. We are not here for economy. We are here to reach to 
uh, you know, the mystical, perfect human condition which God has asked us. And there are plenty of these examples that Khomeini has completely ruled out this kind of, you know, say, reformist idea of uh, religion being for the sake of, you know, uh, this world. And as famous as he said, uh, we didn't this revolution for watermelon. This revolution was not for melons. Right. It was for Islam. It was for the other world. And, and that's the result you can see, for example. One result is the war in Iraq. Iraq invaded at the early revolution years, and Iranians, you know, uh, they started defending. But what happened inside that, you know, scene, it's, it's really shocking. And it can show that, okay, Khomeini's, you know, ideas, mystical ideas are really uh, crystallized in the way Iranian fought the war. Yeah, the, the war was kind of a, 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 I don't know if it was a, an opportunity, but a, a boon for his project of political Islamization, right? It, it was. It was because the war was all about, you know, death. And death has a very, very central, say, your, uh, you know, location or, you know, weight in, in this kind of otherworldly religious uh, ideology that you have lots of religious texts that reminds us think to death humans you are created for death and this life is only a second of what will you have you know so so it was kind of you know how many use this fertile you know ground to to spouse this idea of mystical world during war and it, it was a perfect time because uh, iranians you know because of their lack of experience many iranians they use this uh, you know human wave attacks mm. on iraqis instead of uh, you know probably using more intelligent you know devices and tools all military weapons and it was all you know the ground it it was uh, based on this whole ground in ideology that death or human life is not, you know, that that precious as we think. Because shahada or martyrdom is the ideal, is the ultimate goal of all humans. So, so this, you know, all completely, you know, framed the way people were, you know, thinking and expressing, you know, uh, tactics of war during the early revolution. If Iran had been secularizing for for many years, especially leading up to the revolution. How is it that the masses bought this idea of, I mean, this this level of religiosity, this, this for example, the idea of martyrdom, etc.? Iranian society, like many other traditional societies, has been, you know, uh, you know changing during the, especially 20th century, has been modernizing. But but this kind of substantive secularity, uh, it's it's really, say, uh, it takes time. It's not something overnight. So while people were modernized, their patterns of thinking were traditional still. So you have many graduates from, you know, different universities from Western countries that they still have this kind of, you know, traditional worldview. And the second is that uh, Khomeini was modeled you know, after Iranian Shia imams. And it was really, uh, you know, well-rooted in Iranian social imaginary. So if you, uh, you know, familiar with Shia ideology, they have these 12 imams, they were perfect humans. And Khomeini was seen, it, it, it was never expressed in words, it wasn't been uh, doctrinalized, you say. But it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, say been imagined as if Khomeini was also an imam, and the way people you know saw him was in the same you know manner. But right now, after forty years, you would say, okay, it, it looks like really it has changed. Mm. Even right now, Ayatollah Khomeini and many of his followers, you know, they don't try to theorize him as a, you know, on par with other Shia Imams. So, so it has substantially changed. After, after Khomeini's death, uh, you argue that the, uh, and you did a few minutes ago, that the secularization process 
uh, let's say, resumes in Iran. Uh, and it became an attempt at realizing an Islamic secularity against a Western secularity that was being pursued or imposed by the Shah's regime. Uh, but you even talk about this Islamic secularity starting under Khomeini. I want to quote you, um, if you'll indulge me. This is a quote that I think is uh, it really captured me here. Um, this is in your book. You say, the modern project of the state was based on, you're talking about under Khomeini now, was based on foundations entirely inconsistent with the deeply otherworldly and celestial orientation of life in a Shiite mystical worldview. Therefore, during his period of running a modern state, Khomeini's thought underwent deep transformation to the degree that he became an excessive statist at the expense of even the most basic practices of the faith like prayer and Hajj. Khomeini's project of purification of souls and hearts was over shadowed by the political project of the revolution that defined itself as a rival to the existing camps of communism and capitalism an Islamic third option. Therefore, except for a few years during the Iran-Iraq war, which we've just talked about, the revolution ended up as a symbolically Islamic solution to a problem of mainly Western origin, whose main frameworks, rules, and criteria of success were defined by modern earthly concerns. Are you basically saying here, Iran ended up with secularity, but a Shia version? Yes, yes, exactly. It was the Shia version, say, the Islamic version in general, but Shia version specifically. Yeah. And you know what happened was it, the whole idea of, uh, say, otherworldly, Sufi, mystical view of Islam, it's inconsistent with keeping a whole apart of an of a modern you know state because to to run a state you need a lot of worldly world oriented you know this worldly say mechanisms that there are always frictions between uh, your other worldly principles and what's required by the state and and that's that's what happened even during Khomeini's you know time. So when uh, there were these kind of frictions happening, inconsistencies happening, probably uh, he he had to concede sometimes. So so this is kind of inherent or self-destructive nature of you know uh, reconciliation between this kind of other world, the mystical uh, view of Islam and the mother state, and it wasn't successful actually after Khomeini, even during Khomeini, but uh, mainly after him, you know, it's it's completely returned. The waves returned, they have to uh, completely you now change the way it was before during Khomeini. So so it was, yeah, and probably the, about the Shia, the specific Shia version, it's important to note that, you know, Shias had never you know, have this experience of running a government before. And uh, they, are, they have always been a minority, you know, within their own communities. They didn't need those kind of um, adapting low to society. So they, their doctrine was more individual, you know, individual salvation of their followers. So uh, during, you know, what happened during Khomeini was that he has to, to kind of, you know, change this, uh, say, uh, the whole tradition of Shiism into something, on the one hand, which is mystical, on the other hand, has a serious, you know, legal weight mm. or uh, legal expressions and means. Mm. But, you know, it's difficult because just the terms uh, are, uh, I mean, as you explain it, we understand, but I mean, on the face of it, uh, Islamic secularity or Shia secular secularism, it just, they just sound like oxymorons, you know? So it's helpful to sort of understand on, on a granular level what you're talking about. How do we see, for example, secularization of culture in Iran by the early 2000s? You talk about what's happening, say, on television and film. Can you speak to that? Oh, well, let me give you some probably concrete examples. One example is alcohol. Okay, so, you know, alcohol is forbidden in Islam. Basically, uh, if you consume alcohol, uh, you know, you are basically attracting 74 to 80 lashes. And it's, it's a cardinal sin. After the after revolution, uh, alcohol is being banned. 
and uh, you can find it. It's, it's a serious, you know, persecution about it. But during the late, say, uh, 2010s, you see this uh, gradual, you know, change of discourse and the way people talk about alcohol. While previously, you are speaking, you know, you are using the specific Sharia laden term, which is Kham. You know, so it is a it is a word which is rooted in you know Sharia. So it it has a lot of moral, ethical connotations. But then people, uh, and not just people, the government itself, they started you know, changing this you know Sharia laden term to to more neutral, you know, value neutral terms such as. Nushidani Haya Alkoli in Farsi, which means, which it is a literal translation of alcoholic beverage. Drinks, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so instead of, you know, using those value laden terms, you're saying, so it's, it's in terms, you know, it's in words and expressions and language. And then when it goes to persuading people not to use alcohol, you're still, you know, it's, it's banned because it's very symbolic. And you are an Islamic government, you're not supposed to say it's free, it's banned. But people, how you persuade people during the revolution, when, you know, early revolution, when people were religious, it was simply enough to say that, oh, because God says. But right now, you have to make a lot of, you know, video animations, clips, and so on, that show people, no, alcohol, you know, drink driving causes accidents, for example. So it's dangerous for your life. So it shifts from a religious, you know, phenomenon, which was banned, and was a cardinal thing, to, to kind of medical, you know, right, right. Uh, public health issue. Right. And then you see uh, in Iran, they, they start, you know, establishing probably, I remember when I was writing the book, the number was 150 rehabilitation centers for alcoholics. Right. It's an admission. It's an admission that... We know you're drinking. Uh, we're and and you know we that that it's we basically failed to ban alcohol. Uh, and, exactly right. Yeah, that I mean you use two examples actually to illustrate what you call the secularization of Islamic morality in contemporary Iran. The first is alcohol. The second is the hijab. Uh, talk about that. You know the discourse on hijab has undergone three stages. One stage is a traditional notion of hijab. You know this hijab or uh, head color is discussed very, very rarely in uh, traditional uh, jurisprudential books. And probably the whole book or the whole, you know, compendium is 10 volumes. What is, you know, relevant to hijab probably doesn't exceed two pages of it. Okay. And then during the early 1920s, you know, 1930s, uh, you know, after this uh, Western notion of uh, relating Muslim backwardness to hijab and, you know, sometimes encouraging, you know, devailing and what happened in Iran during Reza Shah period, which was the devailing of women. After that, you had like, uh, you know, a wave of writings, books, treatises about the importance of hijab. So something which was very, very marginal becomes, you know, comes to the center of religiousity and continues on during the revolution. Of course, uh, those women who doesn't, who don't have uh, head covers, they are banned from public spaces. Then they have, everybody has to have head cover. It's illegal, you know, to debate and all this, which goes on and goes on. Well, what happens is the game, like alcohol, people, they don't believe in the underlying, you know, metaphysic of hijab why should i have hijab you can you could say you know you could answer uh, 20 years ago 30 years ago it's because god says all right now you say no not just because they believe or in god or not because there are uh, probably hundreds of rival theories about it and so you need to and of course many people they, they think that this is not an enough answer you need to always have some kind of you know other substantive reason to doing something important so they, they have to try, you know, to, to substantiate or to justify hijab by completely non-religious terms. For example, they, like in words, in, in the expressions, they have changed hijab to pushish. Again, hijab is uh, Sharia laden. 
it's it's Arabic. Pushish is it's completely neutral, so so that people can you know start communicating with, and then uh, but they have tried to justify it like hijab is good for family. Hijab is to protect your, uh, you know, uh, you from crimes. It's to protect you from, you know, social ills. And and the other one was okay. Uh, it's it's a kind of national uh, dress of Iranians. The other one I think is is more interesting is that uh, many now justify hijab like this. So okay, like all Western countries, that they have some kind of minimum dress code. We as a society have as, uh, have our own laws, so you have to, uh, you know, observe those laws. Mm-hmm. This is a law of land; you should keep it. And and this is not so. It's, you know, this is not about being religious or justifying it as a religious. It's just about okay. This is a law of land, and uh, so just keep it. It's like Western. Some in some places, the minimum dress code is a bit, you know. Uh, say more than others in some others, you know. So it's it's just kind of ch- different societies with different, you know. So it's again pluralism. But the, the, uh, you know, behind this, you know, thinking and argument is that okay, these different options of having, you know, hijab or not having it in Iran and West, they necessarily don't, uh, you know, have a kind of moral preference to each other. Just because in Iran we are in Iran, we have a specific culture, so we wear hijab. Hmm. But it's not driven by religious thinking, and that's the kind of you know deep uh, say changes happening. Right. And of course, it in terms of the external view of it also change. You know, the, the kind of hijab right now you see in Tehran is different. Even the kind of hijab the authorities are talking about is different. So yes. Uh, yes. when they want to justify it, it's, it's about, for example, the government agencies talk about it. It's more about Pushesh mod, you know, Iranian pushesh, which means Iranian, you know, uh, dress and this kind of so yeah, yeah. trying to nationalize this whole thing. I, can I ask you about uh, post Khomeini? Tell us a bit about the secularization of education and uh, basically the secularization of of knowledge. Well, this was happening. I mean, secularization of uh, knowledge, institutions of knowledge has happened from the early 20s with, you know, modern schools coming to Iran, modern universities, and then, uh, you know, the, the whole the monopole of uh, religious institutions of knowledge being a kind of fracture. And the whole during Pahlavis, of course, it was uh, progressed too far, I guess, so that religious institutions, uh, they became kind of minority in the whole institutions of knowledge. Uh, after revolution, revolutionaries, they, they really uh, recognize that there, there is something happening when you need to do it. Because, in, you know, in the universities, we are teaching people all Western-oriented, uh, say, knowledges, whether it is in technical, you know, knowledges, uh, applied sciences, or in humanities, social sciences, and then in schools. But what they did, again, was not some kind of substantial changes. So, uh, for example, in schools, beside other materials like physics, like chemistry, math, and literature, they have added a few more items. Of course, these items were there before the revolution as well. So it wasn't that they have completely changed, but they increased the amount of, you know, religious, say, sub- subjects, which were mandatory. And in, at universities, the same happens. So uh, we have this huge movement of uh, Islamization of knowledge. This has been started from the revolution, but uh, every then and now, it starts getting a momentum by the recognition that, okay, it, it looks like still there is something very, very substantial uh, missing in, in the whole institution of knowledge. You know, this, this idea of Islamic secularity, um, when first reading it, I mean, it's, it's, it's very, uh, it's, it's a very expensive kind of term. It's very, it's very academic. Uh, it's paradoxical. It's fascinating. It's a Islamic secularity. But the, when I think about it and I think about how Iranians, you know, you sort of middle-class Iranian and the diaspora, um, connects, 
uh, to to religion oftentimes and and to modernity it's a really apt term now I now if we I mean we have to untangle ourselves from the the current regime in Iran okay if we just sort of eliminate that for a second um, I, I wanted to tell you that we had a, a recent guest on our show um, who in the middle of our interview uh, uh, who was talking about a very difficult upbringing he had in, in Iran where he was bullied, et cetera, and, and now he lives in Canada. And uh, and he said he was a Muslim. And I said, oh, well, that's very interesting because um, you're a drinker and you're gay uh, and you're quite liberal in your thinking. And, and he sort of laughed and said, yeah, well, I'm, I'm an Iranian-type Muslim. <laughs> you know, and 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 I I know a lot of people, including myself, know exactly what he meant by that. And I wonder if that again, if we untangle it from the the, the you know what the regime aspires to or whatever, I wonder if that's an example of Islamic secularity. I guess that's that's also you know one of those you know uh, manifestations of Islamic secularity. Of, of course, this is. Uh, this is graded issue. This is a, you know, so on the one hand, you know, on the one pole or extreme, you have more conservative kinds of Islamic secularity. On the other hand, of course, you have more liberal ones. But all of them, they share the whole, uh, say, underlying, you know, uh, metaphysic that religion is something cultural, is something about rituals. And depends sometimes you take it more serious even those rituals sometimes you don't take it but but it doesn't have a substantial role in our everyday life we never do economy with religion we never you know base our foreign policy on religion maybe we use sometimes those slogans religious slogans for just a very small uh, segment of population so that they can go to war you know they can go to syria so when uh, for example, one example is, I, I, I guess, very interesting. When you're talking to your, you know, close or, uh, you know, committed youth, you want them to uh, send them to Syria to war. You talk about defending Shia shrines. Okay. But when you want to justify the whole, you know, operation in Syria, why you go there for the general public, you're talking about just simple, you know, geo geopolitical issues. Say, okay, we are going to fight terrorists in Syria. Daesh or ISIS, Islamic State, this is a matter of security. Mm. So if uh, right now you just translate sometimes, you know, some of uh, Khamenei, the current leaders, um, you know, messages, you rarely find something that if you don't know how many has written it, that this is about Islam or anything else. And you have lots of them. So it's, it's just kind of, you know, post-colonial, say, leftist justification, sometimes national interest. And every time Khamenei says, he says, you know, our relationship or lack of relationship with the U.S., it's not based on anything ideological. It's based on national interests. Because otherwise, people don't buy it. Yeah, so, I yes, and I, I, I probably diverged. From no, no, your... no. I, I, but we, it was, it, we, you did, but it was interesting. But even in the, but, but, but I think about the twenty first century, and I think I'm not even sure. I, I don't know how you could try and set up a non secular bubble anyway. Now, I mean, even if. Um, you know, if Khomeini had lived forever, if he was still alive, I know that that, that might uh, uh, rub some people the wrong way, the idea of it, but like, or, or some may get excited by it. If Khomeini was still around and on his path of desecularization, uh, would it even be possible in the age of the internet, in the 21st century? You know, the unless you're North Korea, I mean, you would have to, how would you prevent with cyberspace uh, young Iranians from seeing uh, secular lives outside of Iran? It The whole project seems like doomed to failure. Yeah, it, it is doomed to failure, of course. And you, you see from the you know public, uh, say, attention or public reception 
of those, you know, fundamentalist or extremist elements of Iranian regime that that it, it looks like it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't say. And in my other book, Iranian uh, presidential election, I've completely showed that even the most conservative elements in Iranian, you know, politics, they have to change their, you know, discourse. They had, like even Raisi, you know, Raisi was elected in a very, very non-competitive, the, the most non-competitive election after the revolution. But even Raisi, in his, uh, you know, election uh, speeches, he had he has to change his discourse. He always said, okay, we are not like extremists. I'm not going to impose harsh Islamic rules. And so you will see that it's not working. And right now, Iranian revolution doesn't invest, I mean, Iranian government, the state, doesn't invest that much on uh, religious you know, discourses and tries to diversify the whole discourse, a cascade of different discourses to, to, uh, you know, to attract different segments of society, but mostly secular ones. I mean, then we're talking about uh, that we have you know, given up those ideals, but basically, when you hear them, they are all secular. So even when they want to justify, say, uh, hardliners, you have to bring secular, you know, justifications. No, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Nobody buys. So and and also inside, you know, to, to understand the, the uh, dynamics of Iranian domestic politics, you just look at different uh, elements of power. Those who are, you know, probably close in their thinking to Khomeini, they're always in very, very minority. Like Jalili, so who was one of them who was who was advocating for this kind of you know, harsh policies. Even inside extremists, he was you know sidelined. And mainly because okay, people know. Basically, finally we want some kind of minimum reception from people. This Khomeini like, you know, discourses doesn't have any any attraction, you know, for people. It's really, it's a really interesting conversation. It's a really interesting book you've written and thesis. I, I'm guessing that you, you do not believe, based on what you've just said, that the Islamic State could survive, uh, would have survived, or could survive with an even more formalist version of Islam being imposed on the population of Iran for the last 42, 43 years, right? Oh, of course, of course. It wouldn't have survived. And, and you know the problem with uh, right now the problems Iran have, you know, it has in terms of you know economy, in terms of any other thing. It's not because it's Islamic, you know, because it has imposed any kind of Islamic, you know, say uh, rules on people. It's more about their geopolitical kind of you know uh, discourses and the way they are working with the West. It doesn't have anything to Islam. It doesn't have anything to do with you know. So basically, if Iran was kind of you know in a good relationship with the west it uh, so it would have been economically better off and probably we wouldn't have seen that much of you know uh, say discontent with the regime because basically the change has been there you know and the problems mainly are about politics rather than, you know, the kind of Islam they are observing. Their Islam is not that, uh, I mean, they're substantively uh, different. They are not substantively uh, different from uh, other, you know, say, secular regimes. They're just keeping some uh, some rituals because it's basically uh, justifies why we should rule because we are Islamic. And how we are Islamic, because we, we observe these, you know, rituals, like some, some visible rituals, like hijab. It's very visible. But in all the realms, in economy, in commerce, whatever, in laws, mostly, mostly, other than those which are, as I said, are symbolic, they are secular. A final uh, point to throw at you before I let you go, and again, I'm so grateful for this this conversation and your time today, all the way in Sydney, Australia. Um, you know, you make the point a few times in your book, and it's always very, very compelling when you do, that this isn't just a project that is specific to Iran in terms of the interplay of religion and secularity. 
And so, and, and sometimes you, you talk about the United States, and I should mention that President Biden finishes every speech of his saying, God bless the United States of America, and that church going in the U.S. has increased in recent decades, but as you point out, has also manifested in a concomitant secularization of the church in the U.S. So the kind of pattern that we've been talking about in Iran, although it was done in a much more dramatic way and still has much more dramatic implications for the people of Iran um, with respect to Sharia law, etc., is something we see versions of globally, yes? Yeah, of course. We see it in the United States. Uh, we see it in, uh, you know, in Europe, you know. So many people who who call them uh, officially atheists, they are embracing religion for absolute different reason. One, identity, European identity, so mesh with religion. And so in the United States, you have this, but, but that substantive secularity is going on, you know, behind the scenes and without people noticing it. That's if, you can see in the United States probably in the change of discourse from, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, to the idea of evolution and the whole debate about it, probably before you had this, uh, you know, creationism, then they changed it to creation science, then, uh, you know, intelligent design right now. And when it comes to other, again, conflicts or other, you know, disagreements about religious items, like a, you have this, for example, phrase of pro-life yeah. instead of, you know, saying yeah. they are. So they're rolling back abortion laws in 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 America in the name yeah. of religion. I mean, yeah. it's yeah. So so it's, the change is there is going on and it's kind of global. So we are basically attributing less and less events of the world to gods. So uh, we base less and less, say, our everyday life on anything religious. And this trend, you know, this trend of, say, differentiation, uh, say, you know, making religion more symbolic rather than substantial, you know, has been going on, it's continuous. And, and this is interesting because people often say, oh, it looks like secularization doesn't work because people are more religious. And when they say more religious, they say because they... They go, you know, they, when they talk, ask them, they say, oh, yeah, I believe in God. But they don't realize that. The whole meaning of, you know, uh, this, you know, uh, statements have changed. So the God, this new modern, you know, people are talking about is different from 40 years ago, is different from 100 years ago. It's much symbolic, cultural, you know, uh, ritualistic kind of thing, a matter of identity rather than being substantively at work you know, in the whole apartheid of, you know, universe. What about what about yoga? Does that count as, uh, as religion? There's a lot of people doing it. <laughs> yeah. You know, many kinds of religiosity we have is even thinner than yoga. You know? You know it's, it's just one matter of word, you know, I believe. And then I, I go to church or something, and said there's no difference of substantive, you know, change. So at least at yoga, you do something. You try to, you know. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Actually, believe in some kind of substance. That's right. You're, you know, and you're actually <laughs> trying to. You're right. Actually, I shouldn't. I shouldn't joke about that. Uh, Doctor Mahmoud Paragu, uh, it's been a. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for this uh, book you've written, and I look forward to uh, chatting with you again in the future. Thank you so much, Gian. Thanks for your time, and thanks for all your audiences who will be uh, listening to to our talk. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Dr. Mahmoud Pargu, an Iranian-Australian social scientist and philosopher, his new book is called Secularization of Islam in Post-Revolutionary Iran. Dr. Mahmoud Pargu joined us from Sydney, Australia today. This is full time for the Rook Media series, The Contemporary History of Iran, this being part 24 Please check out all the episodes of this series and our regular editions of Rook and all things related at rookmedia.com. Rookmedia.com. That's our website where you can also become a patron by pressing the support us button. Thanks to the team who make Rook Media happen, talented Anahita, Super Patty Sapon, to the artist Savvy Roham, Aurai Mehdad, 
the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shia. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you've not done so already. Find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi and Mizunbashi. Bashi.